This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Susan Jervis and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. Susan, thanks for all the support and encouragement you've given me and also to the rest of the comp climbing scene. I hope we'll talk soon. I also want to thank everyone who watched Blockbuster live on YouTube this past weekend. I had my usual boatload of fun casting the event and working with Dustin Curtis, the production crew from E There Live, and of course my old homies from Climbers Rock. It just it feels really good to work with a team of people who want to do a good job. We had one or two technical bugs, but overall the comp and the stream were excellent. So head to Climbers Rock channel on YouTube uh, to watch the full replay. And lucky for me, I'm back on the casting desk next Saturday, January the 27th for the Ontario Open 2018, which for our American listeners is basically comparable to one of your national series bouldering events. And the results play a role in choosing which Canadians get on the Canadian and national bouldering team. I'll start advertising the link for that in the coming days, but for now, make sure you keep your evening free to watch some awesome bouldering with me, broadcast live from Boulder's Climbing Center here in Toronto. Anyway, today's episode. I've been trying to schedule an interview with Sylvia McBurney since the summertime, so I'm really glad we finally got to talk. She's been working with the CEC for a few years to push our coaching standards into the future, and she's just published the Long-Term Athlete Development Plan for Canada. This document is a huge deal for sport climbing in our country, and it's a model that more and more countries are looking to emulate. So if you're a coach, a comp organizer, a parent, this is a document you really want to check out, regardless of where you're listening from. It's beautifully formatted, so it's easy to read, and I really learned a lot. But that said, it also raised a few questions, and that's how we get to this interview. So I'm joined right now uh, over Skype by uh, Sylvia McBurney. She's the Coaching Development Director for uh, the CEC, and she was the lead in developing the LTAD for sport climbing in Canada. Uh, Thanks, Sylvia, so much for taking this time to talk with me. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think it's best just because, especially in climbing, some of these terms are pretty unfamiliar. So I I wanted to start with a really short explanation of what an LTAD actually is. Could you explain that for everybody? Okay. Uh, Well, it is a a LTAD stands for long-term athlete development. And essentially there are various stages that we take into consideration an athlete's or a participant's uh, developmental uh, stage that they're at, uh, their emotional stage that they're at, physical, et cetera. So it, it encompasses all those aspects within the framework of sport climbing or um, in other sports within their sport. Okay. So what was really interesting for me when I started digging into this is that the idea of this long-term athletic development uh, program uh, it seems to be a fairly new one. Um, within the last, you know, couple decades, it seems this idea is uh, kind of developed. Where is this movement or this framework uh, come from? Uh, well, in Canada, it stems from our sport policy. So, about fifteen years ago, and the goals were to enhance um, our the excellence, participation, capacity, etc. But really, it's to make more of the general population fit and more people participating at a higher level, uh, as well as a more integrated approach within the sport system, et cetera. So it actually stems from sport policy within Canada, but really these these concepts are pieces uh, from science and sport science that have been pieced together to create a, an athlete pathway. It's actually not new. It's just there it, in this model, it's been pieced together. Okay. Um- you kind of touched on it, uh, that this model isn't necessarily just for athletes. Um, you used the word participants and, and I think that's really interesting. The idea that this is, is meant for everybody involved in the sport. Um, it goes from, you know, little kids to, to people in their old age at every level of, uh, of involvement. So how can a document that addresses so many different types of participants and climbing, uh, address all of those things? How is it formatted to work for everybody? Well, essentially, this is a foundational document. So what it does is it takes the broad 
population where you have people who are participating in recreational sport, competitive sport, and uh, and sport for life as an adult or even as a youth and you're not necessarily um, competing at a, at a high level. And what it does is it creates a, a framework or a structure that we can then base our choices from. So this is a 1.0 version. Other sports are now into their 2.0 versions where uh, so it's a growing document. So essentially we're looking at it from the standpoint of it's it's a uh, we're looking at it from if you if you were three years old and you were going to climb, should you train for five hours a day? Probably not. So it's it's putting in writing uh, standardized approaches to coaching and teaching and working with people and what's acceptable and what isn't from a science standpoint. A question I had is what what is the benefit for sport climbing or maybe specifically uh you know, the CEC Climbing Canada, why is this such an important document for us to have as a, as a sport here or from the perspective of the governing body? Uh, well, that, that's, there's several answers to that question. So uh, one is we're currently not recognized as a sport in Canada, which means uh, we are, we're not currently funded, but being funded in, in, support and infrastructure and so forth and coaching development because without support from Sport Canada where they recognize us as a sport uh, without that we actually can't even create a coaching development program so this document is foundational for that as well as from this we can create a high performance model we currently have uh, Jeff Thompson who's now taking on that role so that'll be fantastic to see where this goes in the high performance stream so essentially what it's trying to do and what, what from my understanding that uh, the government's perspective is, is that this document says that we as a sport within Canada are all on the same page. That's why we had to have a cross-section of coaches and, and uh, experts from across the country contributing to the document so that we could say that there was a cohesive plan regardless of whether you were in BC or on the East Coast. So it's really creating consistency within um, and again, you know, it, it's it's really based in sport policy. So if the government is saying we want to see a consistent model, they want to see that in BC they have a model that they're following, and it's the same in Ontario. Just as an example. Okay. Um, could you talk a bit about the process of putting this together? Like, uh, you know, how many people were involved in this, and how long this process took to come up with the final product? Okay, uh, well, essentially, essentially um, Maria Esquerdo, who uh, probably about six years ago, she was uh, she was highly involved in making this happen for the CEC and, and the reform, et cetera. And at the time, I was looking to contribute uh, some time and energy into the development of the sport on, on a bigger scale. So I had uh, made contact with her. And essentially, from that point on, my responsibility was to, to work on this area, this uh, the long-term athlete development. So what we did was, at the time, was create a rough structure of, okay, what do other LTADs look like? What's the expectation? What is the science behind it? How does this apply to climbing? What are the hours that we should, if we're going to have a, co like a, a program for a, a, a kinder program, four- and five-year-olds, what does that look like for time? What does it look like when you're in the training to compete stage, when you're in in high school. So I created that framework. And then essentially from that, the, um, the coaches from other parts of the country in sort of round one participated and reviewed it and contributed it and so forth. It was really more of a modification of what was there. Then what happened was is a few years ago, again, um, I was approached again to take on this, this fully and really because it kind of had, had dwindled off and, you know, things it is, were all volunteer based. So essentially it was sort of, um, it, it hadn't taken hold yet. And so I said, okay, I, I've been asked to take on this role of coaching development director. And with that, what, what's going to happen is I really have to make this happen. So I approached Sport for Life. They essentially, uh, they review all of the LTADs. They approve them, uh, et cetera, for every single sport in Canada. And uh, there was an opportunity for me to uh, crew create a community-based program that would then feed into the, the LTAD. My program was to be held in Ontario 
and it was going to be with uh, medical professionals who were all climbers. And what they were going to do, along with uh, competitive coaches within Ontario, we were going to have an opportunity to meet. The medical professionals dissected the document prior to us meeting. I made some more modifications. All the coaches came in to meet, and we sat for a day. We had a consultant come in who helped us structure the uh, the way we dissected it so that it would be more of a, a learning process. And I took all of that learning. I had an opportunity to go out to Banff for the coaching conference, and we did the same thing again, where we had medical professionals within the climbing sector and a cross-section of coaches from across the country who dissected it, who gave their input, who also learned about what LTAD was, et cetera. And in this time, exactly when this is all happening, we had an an NCCP working group that had consisted of Andrew Wilson, Sebastian Powell, Kellen uh, Tepley, a number of people from, and Andrew McBurney, all of us together reviewing the document, um, dissecting different parts of it. Patrick LaBelle was our representative in Quebec. And what they did was they would read parts of the document, anything that stood out, we needed to modify or change. And we built it that way. And I really think that that uh, it really does create a, a very good cross-section. It's, uh, it could always be better. And that is uh, that essentially is one concept within LTAD. Um, that uh, it's this concept of Kaizen, it's a Japanese philosophy of continuous improvement. And the idea is that there will be a 2.0 version, there will be a 3.0 version, as we start to implement these uh, these concepts and, and how it needs to change. So clearly the process involved a lot of uh, professional opinions from, from uh, medical professionals and also coaching professionals. Uh, which frankly are resources that a lot of climbing coaches, especially in Canada, don't usually have direct access to, especially, you know, coaches maybe at a recreational level. Um, this document is, I, I'll have to say, is actually really easy to work through. It's it's uh, it's really well laid out. You can get a lot of information just by browsing. It's, it's really well put together. Um, is there anything in it that you think people uh, will be surprised to read any uh, any philosophies or or um, uh, policies in this framework that people might be a little bit shocked to see in there. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, so essentially, in the sort of stages of one to one to three, from that active start to learn to train stage. So these um, are the, the youngest stages. They're from the young, from the young stages, like you know, zero, like a baby, up till someone is you know twelve years old. And those stages, what what we've seen and what what the experts sort of um, collectively uh, from all parts, not just the medical professionals, but also from Sport for Life, is that climbing is seen as an early introduction, late specialization sport, which would mean that. Hey, get your kid in a program, get them, um, you know, maybe even doing competitions and that sort of thing, but it's not their only sport. You don't peak at 15. You don't peak at 16, 17 even in climbing. So what they're really trying to say is, you know, don't burn out your kids. And so this is where it greatly impacts the competitive aspect. And, you know, when when we get a greater depth of field, we may have a high performance stream that does move in that direction. I, I, I don't think so. Just as we sort of look out there in, um, in the athletes and what they're doing now, like when we look at some of the world-class athletes, they're doing amazing things at 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, maybe, you know, specializing and only doing climbing at age six or age seven, like we have in some other sports like gymnastics isn't appropriate. Our, our lifespan our climbing lifespan is, is much longer than a competitive gymnast, right? So if we look at, because that's considered an early uh, an early specialization sport, and there are very few early uh, specialization sports. So I think that that's going to be one area that we're really going to need to embrace as a concept, um, as a coaching community and a parent community, where we really want to see our our, um, our kids, you know, at the top of the podium, really young and um, sort of strive for that and seeing it as uh, solely focusing on that, uh, this one sport. Uh, but the the science behind it, uh, supporting 
learning other sports. Uh, let's say, for example, in tennis, uh, they see, they see theirs as a very similar. It's not uh, not late specialization per se, but later specialization, and they see introduction to racket sports as a as a valued thing. So get involved in maybe martial arts as a child and gymnastics as a child and allow that to feed their physical literacy so that when they get uh, when they you know 12 13 years old and they want to climb they have and uh, they have this physical repertoire that you know they can they can do dynamic movement or have power in their you know their legs without having to develop it you know, only within a climbing uh, capacity is that, is that How's that? Does that seem like we might get a conflict there, you think? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll get specific about, you know, my experience with it already uh, th this season in uh, our work with the OCF and putting together the Ontario competition calendar. Uh, you gave us a lot of great feedback on how to um, try and get our youngest competitions, which were kind of a, a new separate set of competitions for us this year. Um, how to try and get those more in line with the thinking of the LTAD. And some of the big things were uh, trying to put less emphasis on winning, less emphasis on uh, on placement against other athletes, and more on uh, uh, demonstrating a full set of skills. And that was really interesting for us. It was a new idea. It took, you know, because we've all been living with the idea of, you know, uh, kids in D category still you know, trying to get first place, trying to get on the podium. So for us, it took a little mental twisting to readjust to that. And once we started, you know, putting those competitions out there, now it's the turn for the parents and the athletes to get used to that new idea of, uh, of maybe not winning a medal, maybe not even acknowledging where you fall within the field. Uh, so for us, hearing all that feedback was interesting. And, and you know, we're trying to take the long-term view of, it's a big change this year. Everybody's going to be a bit unfamiliar with it, um, but let's just ride it out and learn how to uh, how to kind of follow this new model together. Uh, so yeah, I think you know for me that was already a, a big one for us is how we treat the younger uh, the younger climbers and competitions. Um, kind of stemming off that is, uh, and this is definitely an area where I'm not a pro, so I have to be ready to sound dumb when I ask a question like this. Um, but from my perspective, a lot of the best athletes, um, you know, the the athletes we know as as big superstar names in their field, and the first one I think of is Michael Phelps. A lot of these world class ultimate athletes are almost um, anomalies. They're like physical anomalies. They're things just worked out differently for them in their development. Uh, how does like, does an LTAD allow for that possibility in climbers? You know, there's already a, a generation of really young climbers like Ashima, um, maybe even Yanya Garnbrett. These these kids who put up world class, top of the podium results internationally really early. Um, does this model uh, acknowledge or allow for that kind of thing? Yeah, they they are anomalies. It's it's not the norm. But their body is still, their mind is still a 12-year-old or their mind, their body is still a 10-year-old. You know what I'm saying? Like they're still, regardless of, um, you know, these childhood sort of superstars, they still are emotionally or mentally or physically still young. And part of this is for us to recognize that that 1% of 1% that is the anomaly, that is that very special case. Most of us sit within the realm of good or great and not necessarily greatness. So I think the best perspective for us to start with is let's use this as a foundation. We have a very good cross section of coaches who have, and some great coaches who have produced some great athletes, uh, contributed to this content. So, you know, and even Sean McCall contributed to the content. He really, he really created the foundation for the training to win component of this in your adult years. And it's, you know, he really stands behind the, the concepts of the document. We have to treat those people who are incredibly special as special and unique and, and, and aim to have a high performance stream to cater to that development. And in this, we're catering to the majority of us who are looking to, I'd like to climb till, you know, a very old age. This isn't a document that is like, okay, everybody, you're a robot and you're going to go and follow. There are going to be coaches 
who follow this or they modify it, it's a framework, right? It's not meant to be like, it, you, you fill in the gaps, right? It's just saying that it's really not a good idea for your, your five-year-old to be doing X, right? And I think that's what's important about it. And I just want to make sure that that point comes across, that, um, that there is flexibility within the structure because there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of missing information. It's just that it creates a framework of don't expect your kid to do a dyno at age five. You know, or, you know what I'm saying? Where, like, don't be like, oh, yeah, come on, jump. You know, they're, a five-year-old is only four feet tall, three feet tall. Next thing you know it, you ask them to do a dyno in a situation that is high risk. You know, maybe you're making a bad call as a coach and an expectation. So that that's kind of what I would really like for people to get out of this. You want your kids to want that medal. You know what I mean? As a coach, mm -hmm. you want them to want it. And you want them to be 10 years old and to be on the top of their game and win every competition but they'll also have high anxiety, probably an eating disorder. Like there's all kinds of stuff that comes with it at a really young age. And how are they able to mentally handle that pressure? And and that's what I think is what we're just missing in this conversation is that I'd like to see that. Uh, people get it. Like, you know what? Like the fact that your kid wins every comp and used to eat is great. That's going to be great for his confidence now, but he has severe anxiety, you know, he's – highly depressed, he won't eat candy, you know, I don't know, like, you have people who deal with all kinds of, uh, you know, as adults as well, you know, especially in, in rope, where they're having to manage their weight. And that is a that's a whole other, when you'll see in the medical considerations, when you're looking at that is that that's a pretty serious, not just self body image, but it's health image, right? So uh, but anyway, I just really, I think that's what I, I, I really value about the athlete development model is that it starts to get you to think, uh, there were a few spots throughout the document that uh, that raised kind of interesting questions about how the CEC might organize their competitions in the future. Um, already, at least between the United States and Canada, there are some differences in, in how we acknowledge different groups. For instance, a few years ago, uh, Canada stopped supporting a national uh, championship for the D category. And in this framework, it does mention the possibility that uh, even the C category maybe shouldn't necessarily um, compete in a national championship. It might be more appropriate for a regional event. Uh, and then in other parts of the document, talking about uh, an important focus should be in harmonizing the, the competition structures across the country. Um, do you expect there to be... Uh, fairly large structural changes and how the CEC addresses the competition scene uh, now that this guideline has been published? Well, I'd like to see some more thinking around continuity. And I, and I really think that that's something we all agreed on in the development was that continuity is really important. And, um, you know, if we're, if we're, we have one particular format and it's a local event, that's fine. You know, but maybe your provincial event is the same in each province, right? Because you may have some athletes who never move past provincial um, local competitions. And they don't qualify for the provincial uh, competitions. And and the interesting thing that you bring up about you know about possibly changing the C category is really more of a you know as the as the field grows and if there becomes a, a high performance stream that that maybe it makes sense to have uh, have them at the national level because they'll have there'll be a great depth of field and there are a lot of athletes actually competing for that. It's a high performance stream. You don't have an athlete who's let's say in bouldering, you know, they're bouldering a V three, but at a, a national level they really need to be bouldering at a V six or V seven in competition. And yet and yet, you know, you have that V3 climber going out to a national in BC, like, or, you know, they're flying out from Ontario. So like, like, you know, they're 12 year old kid, they're flying them out there. You know, what is that? You know, what are we encouraging? Like parents who have the money to, to send their child out there to accept the spot. So it becomes very complicated, right? Like, you know, if you, if you talk about a group of people who are competing at a high performance level and they're always competing nationally, it comes with the territory because it's understood that when they go out to the wall, that they're expected to climb within a range of V6. It's more like, you know, dealing with onsite, et cetera. So it's, we're, we're really needing to, to develop the sport and have a greater depth of field. 
before we can really make any big changes. And I think the CEC uh, is, is making some good steps to that. Uh, in making some considerations, but there will be changes. There'll be changes for, you know, the national series, I'm sure, uh, just in terms of structure. Like they have to look at all of the national level events. And uh, and if they still continue to see value in it, then that's part of the development of the sport. It, it you know, it, it may change as, like I said, as we get a greater depth of field and, you know, it may not. It's it's just a possibility, you know. It might be more valuable to have the UC climbers compete at a regional level. It might be. It's not, uh, you know, it's not unheard of. It's just a it's just a conversation. Okay. Um, so this was published. Uh, I think it was at the very end of December. Um, so we're in the middle of the season. It gives a chance for everybody to kind of read it and get familiar with this. But we probably won't expect any changes in uh, in comps for the remainder of the 2018 season, at the very least. So when we start to get into the summer and into the fall, when the next season starts up, uh, what? How do you want to see the implementation of this um, progress? Like, what do you think are the the starting points that you really want to see uh, happen to get this thing going? Well, I, I really appreciate that Ontario, uh, obviously I'm, I'm here in Ontario, so I, I really appreciate that Ontario has made some considerations for the youth D category that are different than youth D, uh, but still youth D competing at the same time as youth D and so forth. So I think, I think those are the kinds of steps that uh, it would be great to see happening in other provinces and, uh, you know, how we track that or how we encourage it or how we support it, um, you know, would be would be really great for the CEC to offer some suggestions on how to, you know, how to create um, uh, an LTAD sort of friendly competition uh, year um, season. I it, it's all new. It's this is all very new, Tyler. <laughs> so this is really, you know, I, I part of this is is that it's new, and these concepts, some of them we're we're already doing. Like we're already all doing them. Where it will impact it greatly is competition, and and that is the one area that I I think that we have the most to grow in for sure. Okay. Uh, another angle for that is uh, just at the club level or at the gym level, of course, um, aside from how competitions are organized, this gives a lot of guidance to how she would, tr- uh, how we should treat climbers of different ages and different skill levels. Um, so is there, do you feel like there's a, a lot that could change just at the gym level um, starting up, you know, over the next few months or through the rest of the year? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, like I, I've been contacted through Sport for Life. I, I'm their contact essentially, and they they have been it, they've told me, you know, that they're they're actually receiving some communication and people asking about a, an athlete development model for for climbing. So it's not just happening in Canada; it's happening in Canada too. You know, we have uh, various various coaches who are really excited to see it because it creates a framework. How much of the framework you follow depends on your resources. It depends on um, the operations support. Like, do you have the management to support the structure? Um, you know, do you have the parents supporting the structure? Uh, would, we'd like to see like a, a sort of an, a parent LTAD initiative. And those happen at the club level. You know, how involved... Uh, coaches or uh, operations people are, you know, and how much they want to say, Hey, you know, we're not doing this because it's not in the, your, your athlete's best interest. It's not in your child's best interest. Or as an adult, it's really great to do this versus doing this as a kid. So it, it gives you a framework and that's, that's essentially what it is. It's a framework. All right. Um, how will you know that this initiative has been a success? Like, what stuff are you looking out for uh, that'll that'll make you feel like this is starting to work out and be accepted in the community? Well, a lot of it is is actually right now. Uh, it's more of what I'm I'm hearing from feedback from other coaches, 
And some of them, it's actually just saying, because a lot of them are responsible for creating framework that, uh, that they coach these kids on. And some of the coaches come from other sports where there is uh, an LTAD model in place um, or where there has been. And, uh, and it, it's, it helps to provide structure. So right now it's only feedback. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure we're not, uh, we're not there. Like I, I'm, that's a very good question for me to bring up to the CEC and, you know, how can we measure the success of, of offering this? Because it's not just our sport. I mean, there are other sports where, where the, you know, the LTD has been in place for 10 years and at the community level, it's still a, a challenge to have a coach, you know, do certain things or not do certain things. And, um, you know, on, on a really, you know, I could say everything looks great because I'm hearing all this great feedback and yet coaches are not implementing it. And maybe they're, they're, you know, they have hangboard training for their kids all throughout their younger years. And so, so, uh, the, the measuring and the tools will, we'll have to develop what those tools look like. And part of it is, is when we see athletes, overall performing better at the national level where you have national level athletes coming out of this and they're not, you know, um, they're not having as, as much difficulty maybe dealing with the emotional stress or the physical stress or the, the ability to, to perform at a high level. And that those are, those are clear indicators when you start to see an increase in performance versus, you know, having two athletes in top one and two at, you know, at 40 plus moves. And then you have athletes, all, all everyone else at 20 plus moves. <laughs> but if we increase that whole range and we're splitting hairs like you would in a, in a race in, in, uh, in running or in swimming, then we know we've increased that. But then again, it's based on have they implemented many of the concepts? Do they follow LTAD, et cetera? So, it's there's a bit of a gray in there, but I but I think a really good marker would be if it's embraced and we can see it increased in performance. Like I said, you know, many athletes splitting hairs for the top one to ten, then uh, then then I think it's starting to work. But but again, that, that I don't know how measurable that is. It's uh it really is when I say long term, it's these are these are long term outlooks and. And we'll see things if things really stand out that are are not working well, uh, then we look to develop the the two point version. Well, thanks a lot for talking to me. I really appreciate that. If anybody's looking for um, uh, to actually see the copy of the LTAD, where can they go to uh, check this thing out? Uh, well, it's actually it is on the CEC website. It's posted there as well as on Sport for Life, and uh, you'll you'll find it. They've uh, they've posted it there as well for for the whole world to access. Okay, I'll put links up for that uh, definitely then. Thank you so much, Sylvia. I really appreciate it and uh, hope we'll talk soon. Great, thanks, Tyler. That's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Sylvia McBurney for answering my questions and thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you like this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app or consider donating a dollar or two each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly. I love mailing stickers out to new donors each month and makes me feel like some kind of year-round Santa Claus. So give me a reason to send you stuff. I really appreciate the support. Make sure you visit plasticweekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes, including a link to the LTAD we talked about, which is genuinely worth the read. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at plasticweekly.com and you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to tyler at plasticweekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there somewhere. Good luck to everybody competing this weekend. I'll be thinking about you. Talk to you next week.